Hi, everyone. As y'all are joining us, um, thanks so much for being here. We're really glad to have you. Um, we're going to give folks just another minute or two to continue to filter in. Hey, good morning. Hi, good morning. Are we ready to get started? Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today as we kick off All Together, our virtual homecoming and families week. My name is Elena Schusler. I'm Director of Development and Alumni Relations in the Jones Graduate School of Business. It's my pleasure to be here this morning to introduce to you today's speakers. Um, many thanks to Peter Rodriguez, our wonderful Dean of the Jones Graduate School of Business, and also many thanks to Scott Sun and Shine, author and professor of management and organizational behavior in the Jones Graduate School of Business. In addition to acknowledging Scott and Peter, I would like to take a moment to express our gratitude to some special guests that we have with us today. Um, this includes members of the Jones Graduate School of Business Council of Overseers, which is Dean Rodriguez's advisory board, members of the boards of the Rice Business Alumni Association and the Association of Rice Alumni, and last but certainly not least, members of our Rice Business Leadership Society. Um, the volunteer leadership, the incredibly generous donation support and advocacy from all of these awesome groups are some of the big reasons that our Rice community is so special. And finally, a couple of housekeeping items. I just wanna remind everybody that today's session is being recorded and that we'll reserve the last 15 minutes of the presentation for Q&A. So if you do have any questions, please submit those. Um, there should be a Q&A field at the bottom right of your screen. Um, and next, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague with the Association of Rice Alumni, Alejandra Merhead. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. I'm Alejandra Merheb. I'm the Director of Alumni Regional Outreach in the Office of Alumni Relations. And as I mentioned, we are so excited that you are tuning in with us this morning and really kicking off Altogether 2020. Altogether brings uh, the intellectual vibrancy, culture, and creativity of, Rice com of the Rice community to you. Um, we've merged the Association of Rice Alumni's largest events, which are Homecoming and Reunion and Families Weekend. We've moved them online to create a larger and more inclusive digital experience. This week, with the help of our campus partners, we are hosting over 100 events to showcase the depth and breadth of all the great work happening on Rice's campus and beyond. This is an opportunity for alumni, students, families, and friends to truly experience all that Rice has to offer. So please be sure to continue to log on and tune in as we celebrate the global Rice community this week. Thank you. All right, well, uh, I think that brings everything to me. So I wanted to say thank you to Elena and to Alejandra and to everyone out there, our, uh, all of our uh, alumni and others. Uh, we're delighted to be with you today. Uh, I'm privileged to be here with my colleague, Scott Sonenshine, professor and in living a true fireside chat uh, environment, as you can see. I'm sorry I couldn't match that here at the Jones School, but, but thank you all for giving us your time. I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion with Scott. For those of you, uh, you can read about Scott and, and, and he's an interesting uh, professor to us because not only is he very well known outside of Rice, particularly in recent years because of his best-selling books, Stretch uh, and Joy at Work, which was launched this spring and, and something I hope to learn more about today. But before all of that, Scott was an absolutely outstanding professor here at Rice. And I should say during and, and into the future, he will be as well, both in the classroom and especially with his uh, outstanding research, Rice is uh, home to Scott since his uh, days, uh, all of his days as, as a professor. This was his first post and uh, really 
uh, distinguished himself, himself uh, shooting up through the ranks here at Rice. He holds the Henry Gardner Simons professorship and I think is that perfect blend of a professor who can speak to academic audiences with great skill and acumen and move the field forward, but also communicate some of the biggest ideas uh, to people like you and I and to organizations on the front line through more popularized works. Uh, and so we're really privileged to be able to have him here with us today and I'm, I'm delighted to have Scott with us. Uh, so welcome, Scott. I, um, I thought that what I would do uh, is begin our conversation with uh, sort of the elephant in the room, <laughs> which is that we are in this unbelievably unprecedented time uh, when you think about um, COVID and how it's affected our world. Uh, the impacts have been so profound and so wide reaching uh, that it must have been the case that, that you like everyone have taken several moments of pause to think about what's happening, how are we responding, uh, what does this mean? And so I'd like to talk to you about that topic. I, I would say that you know, our world's response to COVID-19 has led to profound changes in how we work and live. And so for you, Scott, what are your observations as both a scientist uh, and one of us, you know, uh, uh, a, a regular person in many ways, coping with the many challenges of working from home, uh, I think dealing with increased anxiety, we can all admit, and dealing with the challenges of doing things like raising children in this environment, balancing work and family and school. Uh, what have you seen and, and what does this period bring out in your mind? Oh, uh, thank you, Peter. And thank you again for having me here this morning. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And I, I mean, you're right, Peter. These are pretty challenging times right now. There's, there's a lot of, let's just call it what it is. There's a lot of pain and suffering right now in our communities and around the world. I mean, there's psychological challenges, there's uh, spiritual challenges, emotional challenges, and of course, there's also economic challenges. There's two things that we as humans really struggle with, and that's uncertainty and a lack of control. And if you think about the pandemic, it has, it has put both of these dimensions on steroids. And that's a really uncomfortable position for people uh, to be in. It challenges our sense of, of who we are and where we're fundamentally going. And so I, I think, as I think about what's happening during the pandemic, people are starting to learn how to deal with just what is it like to be in a world where we have less control than, than we did last year and there's even more uncertainty. And then of course, there's just the more profoundly human challenges that we're social creatures and you know, we're gathering here today on, on Zoom uh, and that's, that's great, um, but it's not a substitution for face-to-face uh, -face and human interaction. And I think you know, maybe at first people were, okay, it's kind of nice not to have to commute to the office or you know, maybe people in the back of their minds were like, yeah, I could probably use a little break from seeing a few of my, uh, my colleagues, but, you know, at this stage, I think many of us absolutely miss our colleagues. We miss that face-to-face -face interaction, that sense of human uh, connection that we all crave. And then on top of this, of course, we're not working in isolation. We're working, many of us have families. I've got two daughters. Uh, they're in what I would call semi-school right now. It's, it's virtual school. They're, they're at home and uh, we've had to step in and pick up some of the burden and uh, in some sense, what I've learned privilege of helping and uh, being more active in their own education. Although I will say after being a university professor for 14 years, uh, it's a much easier job than being a, either a uh, third grade uh, teacher or an eighth grade teacher. And then I think, you know, as I, I think about more broadly, this, is, this pandemic has really been a, a catalyst for change. I think it's provoking a lot of change, both as individuals and also as institutions. And I think one of the things that um, I think some people are learning better than others is how to embrace that change. I've been studying uh, change for my entire career and I know that it's, it's hard and people, you know, they, they, get, they, they get used to habits and certain ways of doing things. And it's uncomfortable to have to shift some of those things and do things a little differently. But I think the reality is, is that's, that's the world that we're in and that's the world that we're gonna be in for the foreseeable future. And so people talk about, you know, I can't wait till things get back to normal when this is all over. And for me, that's a really surprising and perplexing question because 
I'm not sure what normal is going to be at this stage. And I think that, for example, working from home is going to be with us in some form or another for the foreseeable future. But I also think that a lot of our institutions, the way that we shop, the way that we interact, uh, the way that we get along with each other are going to be, if not already, profoundly changed by more or less being isolated uh, for the past uh, year or so. But here's the good news, and here's why I'm, I'm really optimistic uh, despite that, is we know that, we know that change is, is challenging and difficult, and some people, uh, more than others, are experiencing trauma from this. Uh, but we also know that the science teaches us that the majority of us will actually grow from this experience. And there's an area of research on post-traumatic growth, which shows that when our backs are against the wall and we're facing traumatic times like we are today, the more typical response is growth, about finding the silver linings, about using this experience to develop as people and develop as institutions. And that's why, despite everything that's happening right now, I'm an optimist. Well, that, that's, that's great to hear. And you hit so many of the high points. I do think it's true that uh, that lack of certainty and control is present in everyone I speak to. Um, certainly, we all have this sense of uh, not being able to see too clearly what the future will be like. I, I certainly know that for a while in the spring, I think some of us thought probably naively, well, well maybe this will be over soon. And it would have been a blip. But we're far beyond that now. And so everyone is thinking about, you know, what does it mean for the longer term? And it's, it's not even clear when this ends. And so that, that's a great point. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that you're an optimist about the growth we might all experience both individually and maybe through our institutions and organizations. But uh, that, that's good news. I'd like to probe that a little bit more uh, too in our conversation. I, I wondered if you would mind uh, telling us just a little bit more about you know, how it affected you, just like it affected us. C could you give us a sense about how the last seven-ish months have changed your life? Particularly, I know how it affected the launch of your book. You had this fantastic book coming out, uh, joint with uh, you know, uh, Marie Kondo, just a superstar, someone extraordinarily well-known, and, and it was disrupted by this moment too. So how did all this affect you in, in all the dimensions of your life? I, I mean, I've really had to swallow my own medicine. In, in Stretch, I wrote about the importance of you've just got to throw out the plan and you've got to be more improvisational because the world is just so hard to predict. And Marie and I had been working on Joy at Work for almost three years. It came out in April 2020, right in the middle of this pandemic. And, you know, we had to, we had to completely throw out our plan as every, everything uh, changed. It was you know, in February of this past year where we got together and we did a, a little photo shoot to get ready for our launch. And I was supposed to head down to LA a few weeks later and we were going to do a segment for uh, CBS this morning uh, to release for, for launch day. And of course, uh, we, we couldn't travel. We couldn't go anywhere. Uh, a lot of our publicity plans uh, got put on hold because not only was just you know, everything was focused on, on COVID like it, like it should have, and we couldn't uh, travel. But on top of that, we were writing a book uh, called Joy at Work. And I think the, the joke to a lot of people was, you know, joy at work at this stage is, is, is being alive and having a job. Uh, <laughs> why, what else do you, what else could you possibly say, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a one pager. We don't need a, we don't need a book about this because these are the, these are the times uh, that we're in right now. And I, I, I get that, but What's really interesting when you think about joy as an emotion, uh, it's almost like a, like a superpower. It's, it's an emotion that undoes a lot of the harm that comes from other types of negative emotions like anxiety and depression and sadness. And so I was, I was energized about trying to get this message out this, despite all of the disruption to our marketing and publicity plans and everything else going in the world because I knew that this message seemed that much more important because, well, there wasn't too much we could do about the real pain and suffering that people had. We could try and balance that out by teaching them some techniques to add some joy to their lives that were, you know, quite frankly, like, like mine too. I mean, we just, we did not know uh, how things were going to turn out. And I, I still don't think we do. So this is the time to try and find joy in ways that, that we can. And work does offer a great venue to find meaning, to find purpose, and to find satisfaction. And 
it was with that message that I was able to kind of get by some difficult times for me. I, uh, um, you know, I was, you, you plan on doing something for, for several years and you get all excited about it. And then you know, slowly you start to see events get canceled. We couldn't tour and you know, do lots of things. And of course, uh, you know, there were real challenges in, in our own life. I had uh, my mother in the hospital for, uh, for 10 days in the COVID wing, my father in, in the hospital. Uh, it's just, you know, it was, it, was, it was really crazy. So you just have to, to move forward with, with what you have and try and uh, cope with that uncertainty and, and not be afraid of it, to realize that every small step you take to understand a little more about yourself, a little more about the situation you're facing, a little more about your work, is one step closer to dealing with the challenges in front of you. Well, that, that, that's an incredible story. I do think, uh, I can't imagine a more complete taste of one's own medicine than, than that. That's so difficult and, and challenging, the culmination of years of work being disrupted in, in a way that no one would have predicted. I, I don't know if we call COVID a, a black swan necessarily, but I know anyone who, who had experience with that or, or thought about that in the same way, all of the all of the uh, prior examples from most of our lives uh, aren't quite the same. And, and that's quite a bit of a challenge. I'd like to hear more a little bit about that too, a little bit later. And we'll talk more maybe about the lessons of your research, uh, which you've already talked about, but it does sound like they give us reason for optimism and at least give us some techniques that we can use to cope through the remaining period we have and to learn from it. Um, you know, I thought about one other uh, disruption during that period, which which I knew a little bit more about because uh, it was happening here at Rice. And I can remember uh, that you and I talked uh, as soon as Rice decided to go virtual uh, in March, and you had a class coming up, a class that I would say was uh, not suited uh, for online, or at least I don't think we ever thought about them being delivered wholly online. But uh, we asked, we asked you to turn on a dime and produce a hybrid course. I think it was the first hybrid course we had uh, here at the Jones School, which maybe was the first whole, holy one at Rice. Um, you went through that experience too. So uh, what, what, what did you figure out from that? Or, or what, what did you think about that? Just uh, trying something completely new that the students hadn't done either. What, what were your reflections? Yeah, Peter, if I, if I remember correctly, I think it gave me about 48 hours to take my highly experiential right. class uh, where everyone is on teams, uh, sharing physical objects together throughout most of the class in close contact and said, there's no way we can do this uh, you know, during the pandemic, uh, let's put it online. And you know, again, I think my, my initial reaction was, was like a lot of people who would be faced with such a major disruption to their work. It was like, oh gosh, I mean, are you, are you crazy? There's, there's, there's no way that this, this can be done. These, are, these classes are done in person uh, for a reason. But what I also realized is, and this was a, a leadership and, and change class, is that if there's ever a time that we need to be talking about leadership and change, it's right now. And that was a driving force for me to realize that I had a bunch of students whose own lives and own families were just as disrupted, if not more so, than my own. And I saw that as an obligation that in these difficult times with lots of uncertainty and not much control that maybe there was something I can give back and help them uh, get by these circumstances and maybe even teach them a few few tools so they can thrive during these circumstances. So I, I kind of saw that as my, as my mantra moving forward is uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna find a way uh, to make this work. I know it's only two days, uh, but what I want this, what I want my vision for the class is, is really simple. It's, I want an experience that's not gonna just take what we've done in person and put a camera up there and try and replicate it because that's not, that's not what the situation calls for, both in terms of the, the way that I tend to teach my classes is experiential, but also the times that we're in. There's something more profound and even greater importance to what I'm teaching. And I, I didn't want that opportunity to slip away. So as, as, as much as my initial reaction was, you know, you gotta be kidding me. I began to quickly see this as, this is an unbelievable, one of those opportunities that you so rarely have in your career where your timing is just perfect to be in front of a bunch of students who are you know, scared about their health, scared about their work, scared about what's going on in this country and to help give them the necessary tools to try and 
deal with this situation, you know, I saw that as a big responsibility and the responsibility that I, I felt needed to be met with a class that matched the gravity of the situation. So, you know, we created some, some pretty uh, clever exercises with, with what we had around us. So uh, instead of doing a team-based activity where I teach them about resourcefulness, I sent them on scavenger hunts into their, own, uh, into their own houses. And we learned how to repurpose everyday objects to get into this mindset that when your backs are against the wall and you don't think you have much, that's when we can unlock that creativity and come up with new ways of solving problems. And you know, these are classes that were 10 hour days on Zoom. And um, you know, I think, I think uh, at the end of the day, uh, they, went, they went fairly well. And I, I learned a lot from that. And I've taken those lessons uh, into the rest of my uh, dual delivery classes uh, this semester. Well, I, I think they went very, very well. And uh, I can say, um, <laughs> Stunningly, I mean, I, I don't think you ever, uh, you know, complained or anything. You you went right along. I would say, you know, the perspective I had was much like you gave, which is, if it were a different type of course, you know, I teach mostly economics courses. A hybrid online would be sort of a trivial adjustment. You know, we we could do that, and it would just be a matter of uh, adapting uh, a little bit. I think for the type of course you offer, I, I can't think of a course that in its in the way I'd always thought of them was less designed to be hybrid online. But the fact that it worked was amazing and a testament to your uh, dedication, resiliency, and I think you know a, a great proof point for our students who I think could have walked away from an experience like that thinking this, this is never going to work. But I think instead I think thought, well, that was, that was pretty good, you know, and we, we can do this. So I thank you for that. I, I yeah, wanted- I would, What I would say is it, it was such a, I mean, one of the uh, things is I, I learned so much from being one of the, the pioneers here. Just just last week, I, I taught sixty hours over Zoom in in wow. the course of six days, which is it's a lot of it's a lot of time. Um, I mean, one, it's you know, it's obviously exhausting uh, <clears throat> for me, but it's you know, how do you keep students engaged with ten hour Zoom days? And this was a, a different version of a leadership class where we ran um, you know online uh, online companies and to, to give our students the experience of. You know, being able to lead a team and lead a company in an online world, I think was also really, really neat. This is one of these classes where uh, they're making lots of decisions about how to run their companies while they're being faced with challenges. So this was a great chance to say, okay, you're running your company, guess what? A pandemic just happened and now there's a huge recession. What are you gonna do? How are you gonna respond? And we took advantage of the fact that, look, everyone's on Zoom, which means everyone's got a camera, which means we can do a lot of videotaping and give them a lot of feedback. So the idea is to, to not just take what you were doing and throw up you know, a, a little Zoom screen, but it's to rethink how you can take advantage of the circumstances you're in to really push students in ways. And you know, my hope is that this, this class that I just taught fully online over the last week is a class people are gonna be dying to take when they can be back in person and say, we want, a, we want an online version of this class too, because uh, that's, that's the standard that we're shooting for. Well, that's, uh, that's in many ways, you know, a perfectly uh, suited transition to where we want to go. Not only is it the case that I think all companies are dealing with that now, it, it's a live, still running experiment and how we adapt to a world that is profoundly changed and has many constraints, but it is also squarely, uh, you know, in the sights of your research. And, and what I always like to point out is, you know, there are people like, um, like you who actually do hard research that's published in academic journals and then is adapted and, and, and interpreted so that people can apply it in their works and their organizations. And, and your research has been all about things like that. I, I think about uh, your research uh, being particularly appropriate to how people and organizations respond to a world where we're forced to let go of things like travel, which is the most profound in some ways. We don't, we don't go out anywhere almost anymore and meet in person. Those in-person meetings where we would uh, get in a room around a whiteboard or maybe just have coffee, they're gone. The socialization that happens in between those moments. Um, what would you, what, what does your research tell us or what would you tell us about how to deal with uh, some of the struggles of these new types of constraints of not being able to get together, of not being able to uh, travel uh, and experience those things that are, that were so fundamental to the way we work? Yeah, I mean, uh... It, again, it, these are these are hard things because when when we're used to doing things a certain way, 
uh, it's it's hard to just all of a sudden flip a switch and 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 let go of those things. And it it could be travel, it could be uh, face to face interaction, it could be feeling safe going to a to a restaurant or even a a grocery store. And these are things that are are definitely hard to let go of. So I'd say that the the first thing is is really to to keep. Uh, perspective. And it's very easy to get caught up in a game where we make comparisons to other people and we say, okay, you know, these people are, are doing this or they're able to do that. Uh, and I need to be doing the same thing in order to live a happy life or to be successful at work or whatever that goal is, is that you have. And there's kind of a, a really interesting study on uh, on, on the color of grass that I think is, is really uh, appropriate here is, you know, there's a, there's a cliche that says, um, or, or there's a sense that, uh, you know, we really want green grass in our, in our homes. And there's this, this cliche that says, you know, well, you kind of look at your neighbor's grass uh, and it always looks greener. And I think that's, that's, you know, people literally feel that way, but it's also a metaphor about some of our challenges uh, in life, which are we're always comparing ourselves to other people. And when we make those comparisons, we always feel like uh, we come out short. But what's interesting about this uh, study is uh, when you are ogling your neighbor's grass, like overlooking, you know, your fence and staring down at it, the angle that you're looking at that grass literally makes that grass look greener even if it is the same level of lushness and greenness than your own grass. And that's really about perspective, is that when you look at things from afar, you see only a very jaded view of what people are, are going through and uh, their own life circumstances. And if we use that as our motivation for what we want in work and in life, we're gonna end up down the very wrong path. So I think, you know, we talk about all these things that we have to let go. I think it's important to first just start off with perspective and to appreciate what we already have and to recognize that when we look at the way that other people might be living or, or working to realize that it's just, it's just one perspective. So I think that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing I would say is when we face constraints and challenges, that gives us Think of it like a, like a permission slip to be creative. It gives us a license to do things in different ways. And that allows us to learn a lot. During normal times, we tend to follow normal paths of doing things because those are available to us. But when you take those paths away from us, it, it almost triggers the brain and says, okay, our, our backs are against the wall. We don't have to follow the conventional path. And here's the thing, when we don't follow the conventional path, that's when we tend to learn the most and come up with new and often better ways of doing things. So by giving ourselves this, this kind of license or permission slip to create, we're able to cope with, with missing things. So in, in person meetings, sure, might, might not be there, but maybe there are better ways that we can connect uh, via, via Zoom, or if we can't travel, how might we try and replicate the travel experience in, in different ways or substitute it with different forms of entertainment that we didn't even know uh, that we enjoyed. I'd say the third thing is to kind of get moving. When we face challenges, some people's reaction is, is to kind of lock up and to say, think about all of that uncertainty and that lack of control that you have, and you just lock up and you freeze and you're like, let me just wait until things get better. And you know, maybe it's gonna be the end of winter when things are gonna get better. Maybe it's gonna be early spring, or maybe it's gonna be next summer and you keep putting things off and waiting. And we don't know how long the wait is going to be. But what I do know is if we just start moving and we just start experimenting, we start to learn about the world that we're in and we can make things uh, even better. So I, I love to, to go out and to eat. We've got great restaurants in Houston. It's one of the biggest things I missed during the, the pandemic. And I was telling this to my, my two daughters and their response was, well, let's just give this a try. We're gonna, we've never cooked before. We're gonna open up a restaurant and we're gonna create date night for you every Saturday night. And they would research a new country and they would put together a menu of stuff that they would make and they would make us, they, they learned how to cook and they made all of these wonderful foods. I had no idea nor the day that they could you know, be, be really good chefs and the food, the food is really delicious and they get to learn about a culture and have a new experience. And I don't get a bill at the end of the day. I mean, it's, uh, it's really a, a win-win uh, for everything. 
And then I'd say, lastly, I, I think we need to just give ourselves a pass on realizing that things don't need to be perfect. Uh, we don't need to do everything to a level of, of perfection, whether it's what we're working or uh, what we're doing at, at home and thinking that we need the, the perfect family reunion together. And we've, we've always done this and we've brought everyone all over the country uh, together. Um, I think this is really the time to try and do for a lot of our activities, um, you know, good, good enough and to recognize that uh, we've got to just make some changes to adapt uh, at least in the short term. So, you know, we certainly miss being with our family who's out of state, just like uh, many of you probably do too. But, you know, one of the things we started is every Friday night we do a family Zoom call. We never thought of that. We never even, you know, you know, saw each other's faces except uh, when we would get together a few times a year. And now every week, again, it's not in person, but what we can do is we can get together on Zoom and we've all learned how to use that technology and have a nice uh, family uh, sort of in-person uh, get together every week. Yeah, those are, those are fascinating. I, I think there's a, there's a book's worth of good advice just in, in those three points. Uh, starting with the perspective on grass, which I think is both a good literal uh, thought for me, but also a, a figurative one. I think that's really uh, helpful. And then um, this sense of freedom that you can have from, I don't know if I would call it, uh, accepting the, the reality, and, but not being locked up by, uh, you know, uh, holding on too long or, or fearing what this new era means for us. I, I think that's part of what we began to see uh, in the beginning of this is that there was the hustle and bustle around trying to make things work and fit, uh, the, I, the anxiety of trying to finish things that we needed to finish, dealing with the uncertainty of, of, of how we executed things we had never tried to execute in this particular manner before. And then there was also this part that, that, you, that you illustrate really in a beautiful way with your daughters and the cooking on a Saturday night and the Zoom meetings on family. Both of these things were really available uh, the whole time, but you're right, I, I, I can think of things like that that we never tried and then we tried now because of this particular moment that, that sort of thrust the need upon us and, and that's a great outcome. How, how do you think, you know, I think in that way COVID has given us more time with people that we love and, and more time to, to think about how we spend our time because in at least some ways it's, it's less busy. I know I liked a lot of travel, I was watching uh, some, some, I usually get to go someplace like New York in the fall for a variety of reasons. It's what a beautiful opportunity. You, I can't do that now. And you miss that. But on the other hand, you know, I also had trips that uh, I don't miss uh, and time away that I don't miss. How do you think we should you know, make the most of those silver linings of COVID and, and maybe even keep them after? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a great question because in, in many respects, we're in new environments. Even though we're in our home, our kind of global environment has changed. And with changing environments, that's a, a great time to discard habits that aren't working and pick up new habits that can be a, a spark for positive change. So I would say, you know, certainly take advantage of, of just the, the disruption to shake things up in ways that are more positive for your, for your life and, and for your work and, and for your family. Um, and kind of speaking of family, I mean, I, I think you're right. I mean, we've, you know, we're in close quarters. Lots of us are, are working from home and having our, our kids at home and spending, you know, a lot more time. And, you know, it's probably going to be a, a once in a, in a generation uh, lifetime, one of those moments where we are in such close proximity day in and day out. Now, that comes with its own challenges, of course, uh, but it also comes with its own opportunity not to squander that opportunity and to realize that maybe the rhythms of your days will be a little different uh, and you can focus on trying to build relationships and get closer to your loved ones in ways that are much harder to do when everyone's doing, you know, in their own physical uh, building, their own space scattered around the city uh, during the day. So, you know, don't squander this really unusual time in our history to just spend more time with each other in, in positive ways. And then as you're doing that, ask, what are some ways that we can deepen our, our connection? You know, it could be, you know, we do family game nights or just having more intimate conversations, uh, picking up a, a shared project together, whatever, you know, whatever it is, uh, but just find ways uh, to, to deepen that uh, connection. 
Uh, but then also realize, especially for, for those of you who are introverts like me, that you know, we, we need our space too and we need our quiet time. And it's certainly a challenge being in a, a, a household uh, packed uh, with, with a wife and two daughters. I mean, it's, it's hard to get a word in uh, sometimes. And I, I do need that retreat and many people do. So you know, find that quiet space and think about picking up a hobby that you can work on uh, yourself. Um, you know, make sure you're resting up as, as well. I mean, there's, there's a lot to process on a daily basis uh, in the news, uh, possibly at work. Uh, and, and so on. So uh, make sure you take some time uh, to yourself. For me, it's always an evening walk where I kind of head out by myself and just get to decompress from the rest of the day. And you know, for you, it could be it could be whatever. But just make sure you still have time to yourself as well. So, so those are great pieces of advice uh, in a lot of ways, and I and I do uh, connect with a lot of that. I, I um, you know, at my house we have uh, a seventh grader uh, at home uh, on. You're going to school. I have a college junior <laughs> upstairs who's going to school there. Uh, I'm working from home a lot. My wife's working from home a lot. It, it is, uh, it's not anything I would have expected. And it comes with this, uh, uh, you know, boundary busting characteristic, which you, you allude to a lot, which is, I think a lot of people I've noticed are dealing with this question of, well, you know, is it really working from home? If I'm living at home, if, if, if I'm working from home, do I live there? And, you know, how do I, draw the boundaries in a way that enable me to keep my sanity or enable me to have, you know, constructive investments in work and not let them bleed over into life and vice versa. Um, I think even small things like just the routines of getting dressed, getting in a car, not that we miss commuting or that many do, but that boundary would sort of prep us for the work life and then the reverse would prep us for home life again. You've spoken a little bit about that, but any more comments on how we deal with the messiness of this blurring between work, home, and life? Yeah, it's it's actually uh, kind of kind of interesting here because uh, before the pandemic started, I was on my third year of a multi multi year uh, research project on the sharing economy, and uh, this is where you see boundary work at its at its greatest, at least before the the pandemic, as people were repurposing their personal resources and sharing them with strangers. And one of the biggest themes in the research is how to maintain those boundaries to restore the sense of self. And uh, you know, when, when those boundaries get violated, when, when people uh, do things to your possessions that, that you would not want uh, done to them. And as we started the, the pandemic, I, I feel like this research has become uh, relevant for, for all of us who are struggling with, with boundaries. And so there's, there's there's basically two two types of boundaries that we find in this in this uh, research that I think are especially helpful for thinking about managing uh, work from home. One is, of course, is the the physical boundaries and where do you find space to get work done? And that that could be a challenge depending on your living arrangement and who else is is with you. Obviously, if you have a, a dedicated office, that would be you know, the, the the best thing to have to have this space where you can get your work done, and it's it's the place where you get your work done, and, and everyone knows that. But a lot of people don't have that luxury, so it it, it could be uh, repurposing another space in your house. It it could be a a kitchen table is a great place to work, but what's important is that when you are working, it is dedicated to work. So that means clearing off the cereal box and the plates and the cups and bringing them somewhere else and then putting your work stuff down there and, and getting your work done. And then when it's back time for mealtime, take your work stuff off and it becomes a kitchen table and you bring those personal items uh, back again. So I think that's, that's really important is to just find any space that can be dedicated. It could be the corner of a room. It doesn't need to be elaborate. It just needs to send that signal to yourself and to other people that this is my physical space to get my work done. You know, don't put your possessions, your household items uh, in this space. So I think that's, a, that's the, 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 the first thing because you, know, you, you have a lot of interruptions and some of, that, some of those interruptions are, are understandable. Your kid needs help with math in the middle of the day, but you wanna minimize those, uh, those interruptions. Uh, and when people see you working in your dedicated physical space, you want them to, to recognize that boundary. Uh, the science teaches us that a single interruption could take up to 26 minutes for the brain to recover and get back to the point at which it was before. So it's not, it's, it's not that, you know, I just need 30 seconds of your time. I got to ask a question. 
there's usually 26 minutes on top of that 30 seconds that come with it. And that's, that's why it's so important to have those physical boundaries. That's super helpful. I, and I think that that is true. And you do get those little interruptions all the time. I, um, incredibly valuable stuff. I, I want to cover one other sort of general topic before we uh, then entertain some questions from uh, the participants in today's webinar. And this topic is really just about, you know, what do you think, you know, look, not quite looking into the crystal ball, but looking forward, what, what do you think we'll keep from this era? Uh, I, I believe it will pass and hopefully it will pass soon enough and without uh, further disruption or at least uh, damage to, uh, you know, uh, people around us. But when we look to a post-COVID world, um, and we'll get back a lot of things that I think we miss, some of the socializing, some of the opportunity, we'll go back to restaurants, maybe some nice travel too. But if you had to give some thoughts to at least preliminary thoughts to, what do you think is important for us to learn from and perhaps keep from this era? What, what would you say? I, I think boiling down to what's most uh, essential, and you, you hear a lot of, uh, I mean, essential is such a charged word uh, in, in today's uh, culture, but I think at an individual level, what this experience is mm -hmm. teaching people is to really focus on what's essential to their work and their life and to realize that uh, they can uh, get by and even thrive without some of the things that they've had before and uh, they're learning that. Uh, we can think about what this means at work. I think a lot of meetings, they used to be the, the must-have meeting that we would do every week religiously can be replaced with a, with a simple email that just informs people what would have otherwise taken an hour of everyone's collective time to do. So I think uh, realizing that uh, you know, what's essential uh, is, is, gonna, is, gonna, is gonna be a lesson that, that sticks with us and we're gonna have much stronger filters about you know, is this really necessary to do? Does this is really bring me satisfaction and joy by doing this? So I think we have a lot more self-awareness as we've been put in this uh, environment. And then I'd say, uh, you know, really goes back to, to being resourceful as well. Um, a lot of people have learned about being resourceful because of the constraints that have been put on them. And they've realized something uh, that the science has, has known for quite some time, which is that everyone, no matter who you are, where you come from, what background you have, what job you've done, has this innate potential to be resourceful. Children are born resourceful and it's our institutions like work and education that takes that resourcefulness out of them. But it's easy to get back and we see as we've, we've put our own backs against the wall that we've reactivated and uh, gotten back in touch with this inner resourcefulness. And my hope is that we take that lesson with us that even when we no longer have to be resourceful because we can travel, we can see people face to face, we can't do many of the things we've done, or maybe we've even you know, lost a job or if our salary has been cut that we, we've realized that this is a pathway to uh, satisfaction and success uh, in any time. And I, I sure hope that sticks with people. No, that's, that's fantastic advice. I, I think so too. And I think that would be a wonderful opportunity. It's something that I think would never have happened otherwise, which is uh, not to say I'm grateful for this period, but that there are some things that we should learn from it and I think will benefit us. Uh, one more, I think that you've spoken to enough already, uh, a lot already, but I guess just two quick questions. A, do you think we'll have more work from home? Uh, and B, you know, how do you think we should adapt uh, to make it more successful than we've been so far? Yeah, I, I think work from home is going to stick with us. It's going to probably be in a hybrid form. The research says that people who work from home actually put in more, more hours than people who work from the office. Uh, so there's a sense of uh, increased uh, productivity, but of course it creates its own boundary problems around, around time and when work time and when's not work time. I do a little virtual commute uh, where I'll you know, walk around the block and that will start my day and I'll, I'll commute backwards. So there's ways of of dealing with that. But work from home, I think, is here to stay in some form. Uh, we're going to return back to offices. I think people are realizing the relationship stuff. Maybe you can get by for a little while, but you do need those face-to-face -face interactions. And to realize that different, different environments are great for different types of work. So, you know, in-person stuff when you need collaboration uh, is, is a much richer form of communication. And I, I don't think that's going anywhere. But I think people are also realizing wow, I can actually get a lot of project work done, independent thinking done when I have my own space and I'm not constantly disrupted by what's happening in the office. So I think 
we're going to end up with with some type of hybrid. And you know wh what those percentages look like, I think, is going to be something that companies are going to start experimenting with. But I think they've realized that not everyone's going to just you know end off uh, end up at the beach and and not put in any work uh, if we're not watching them. Uh, you know, coming to the office was often seen as a way of monitoring and controlling employees. But as we kind of shifted how we think about work from you know, people really want to bring their best to work, uh, we, don't, we don't need that type of monitoring. We can use the office as a way of uh, inspiring collaboration and, and group work, and then also give people the space to get independent project work done at home. No, I think that's absolutely uh, going to be a big change. And I'm looking forward to a lot of that. Certainly all the business leaders I've spoken to expect more work from home too. I think making it work is, is the next big challenge. Uh, finally, you know, something that's uh, near and dear to uh, us, uh, but also probably to everyone on the call is, is thinking about higher education, uh, education in general, but maybe just for a moment, thinking about things like traditional experiences at colleges and universities, something that we're a part of enjoying, creating, uh, you know, living in. Uh, what, what do you think we could do to ensure <laughs> that uh, you know the rice experience or what has traditionally been thought of as a college experience uh, it continues to be outstanding I, I think assuming that we go back to something in between where we are today and where we were before you know what do we learn about that or what can we do to make sure it's still still a great experience i i, I think the I, I boil this down to to one simple lesson and that's to to recognize the untapped abundance of our students and the, the resources and the wealth of knowledge and perspective and ideas that they bring. And I've, I've seen this in the, my own evolution of, of teaching where you, know, you think, you know, especially you might come out of a PhD program and you, know, you think so, so much of yourself and you're there to, you know, I would use verbs like you know, impart knowledge on people. And that was reflected in, in the way that I've, I've taught, but I think uh, especially for a, a post-pandemic world, I think uh, we need to shift our verbs here. And it's really not about imparting knowledge, it's about co-creating knowledge. And you know, even, even just in last week's class, I made every single one of the 180 students I taught uh, last week a Zoom co-host. So it was about ceding a lot of control to my students. And I, I needed to do that for some of the experiential exercise I was doing. And you know, you know, some people might have a hard time with that and think about, oh, you're, you're giving so much control for your students to basically manage the, the classroom environment. But to me, that's really indicative of the type of world that we're going to increasingly find ourselves in, which is one where as, a, as an educator, my role is, is less to uh, impart knowledge and more to facilitate our collective co-construction of knowledge and to realize that I'm there to to guide and to shape, uh, but it's ultimately the responsibility of the students uh, to create that, that knowledge. And I think whether we're online or we're in person, that's always been a fundamental part of the Rice experience. And I don't think that's gonna change. It's one of the few things that, that probably won't change. But that's great to hear. Uh, and I think that makes a lot of sense, seeding more control and giving particularly the high quality students that Rice gets uh, more involved in co-creating the knowledge sounds just right. And it does sound like one of the real uh, hallmarks of what's always been that experience. Scott, we have some questions from uh, the participants, not, not surprisingly. And so I thought in the time remaining, I, I'd offer some of them to you for your responses. And so uh, I'm going to start with one. Uh, and this is a, a, a good question. It's interesting. This is question is about loneliness. And the question is, loneliness is another epidemic of these times. How can we support our colleagues during this difficult time? Yeah, I, I, I think that's 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 right. And you know, one of the things that uh, when you're in unprecedented times, it allows you to violate norms and patterns of interaction that have been with us for quite some time. So I think it's much more acceptable right now to you know, call on a colleague and see how they're doing and check in on them. And by the way, you know, when you ask someone how they're doing, uh, it's not a perfunctory answer anymore. I mean, you have to be ready for, uh, for a, a meaningful dialogue and to provide empathy and support uh, if they need it. Whereas, you know, maybe before the pandemic, uh, 
uh, you know, it would just seem awkward or, or weird to call in and, you know, call someone up and ask how they were doing, especially if you, you don't have a strong friendship with them. So that's one of the silver linings of this is that those norms have, have been completely shaken up and it's perfectly fine uh, to go ahead and, and reach out to people. And I would encourage you, if you are worried about people, to, to reach out and ask them how they are, but in a way that helps them understand that you're just not asking to check off a box. You're asking because uh, you're interested and you want to hear their answer, however good or however bad it might be. You know, I think that's really good advice. It is something that um, was so easy in the different environment. You could just stroll around or you'd run into one another or vice versa. And there isn't really uh, the casual uh, walk by uh, in a virtual world. You know, I, I think that's difficult. And even for our uh, neighbors and others, you know, it can feel awkward to, to try to be present physically. You know, you really have to do everything through some virtual means or almost everything. And, and that has been tough, but I think that's good advice. And I do think that the point the participant makes is an important one. I, I do know that, um, you know, for the, the descriptions you and I gave of sort of a uh, household that has a lot of busyness in it, for many people, and we knew that from a lot of our alums, uh, especially early in the spring, they were living uh, in New York City in very small apartments and really locked down completely. It was a very trying experience for many of them uh, and uh, in one that they needed help to, to make it through. Um, I have another question. I'm gonna go a little out of order because of uh, the logic of some of these questions uh, and how they hang together. But sort of on the other end, I have this interesting comment that says, I've noticed a lot of different levels of bandwidth for virtual meetings. Uh, what are your suggestions for dealing with uh, Zoom fatigue? I, I've noticed a lot of different, was that banter? Bandwidth. Oh, bandwidth for, for okay. And, and okay, and what to do with Zoom fatigue. Yeah, I, 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 I think this is a, a problem that I thought really hard about because I'm, I'm teaching 10 hour days over Zoom and the last thing people want to do is just look at, look at a, a green dot on their, you know, on their uh, camera for, for 10 hours. So I think the first thing is to ask, you know, do all those things need to happen over Zoom? Um, you know, think about whether the meetings that are, are most essential, uh, most helpful and most productive. And if they're not, for example, they're just informational meetings, uh, send out uh, an email about it or even make a short video that people can watch on their own. So I think that would be helpful. Uh, a second thing I would say is some interesting research about Zoom screens and what you do with your environment. And the research shows that you can actually build connection with colleagues by uh, not using a virtual background and making your screens available and letting people have a window into your home. It's a way of just humanizing you. And you know, even when you're your pets or your, your children kind of come into the screen. It's also kind of humanizing, you know, when that serendipitously uh, happens because we've all been there before and we've all had those disruptions. So it's a way of, of bringing people uh, together. I'd say the third thing that I would do is to try and mix some things up. So, uh, you know, if there's uh, ways you can structure meetings, like I structure my classrooms where you've got some time on the Zoom screen, uh, but then people are turning off the screen so they don't always have to feel like they're on and they're on display and they do something with even a pencil and a paper. So if you're asking them to come up with ideas mm -hmm. uh, instead of brainstorming, which we know doesn't really work that well in groups, uh, you can try brain writing and have people turn off the screen and generate their own list of ideas first before bringing them to the group. So to kind of mix the modalities, so to go between Zoom and something not in Zoom, that would also help with the, the fatigue as well. Well, that's a, that's a great point. I, I do think that um, it's an interesting point you make about letting people have a window into your life. I, I think the things that have been sort of interesting is how curious we are about how we all live. And it's nice to see someone, what pictures they have on their desk or they have a pet, suddenly the pet makes an entrance or, a child that can be kind of nice or seeing, you know, uh, anything, you know, what, uh, what sort of plants they have in the background. It's, it's all uh, a form of connection. It, it connects also to this other question we have that I think is worth uh, maybe expanding on. It, it's, it's along the same lines, which is, is there any science or research on the impact of the loss of human to human interaction, meaning being physically present together? Do, do we know anything about how that differs or how that uh, maybe lack of hugging or other things that matter for our well-being and the way we live. 
Yeah, I mean, humans are, are tactile people and that, that physical uh, connection, uh, being in the same room, uh, that, that absolutely does matter. And that is, that is one of the biggest losses uh, during this, this pandemic. So there's, there's no question uh, about that. And we can try and come up with ways of best replicating that uh, experience. But I, I think the person asking this question is, is absolutely right. I mean, that's, that's you know, something that is, is incredibly hard uh, to be able to uh, replicate. So what you do need to be asking yourself is how can I build uh, connection through alternative uh, pathways and work with, with what I do have? Um, and you know, maybe there are ways where uh, you can do something uh, socially distant outside uh, to, to get closer to people. That's certainly uh, one way of trying to bring in some of that uh, closer contact. Um, but, um, you know, I, I don't think anyone has come up with a, a solution about, uh, you know, how to, you know, safely uh, hug someone in the middle of a pandemic uh, when they're not uh, living in your household. I think that's right. Um, well, um, I'm going to ask one more, I think, uh, unless there are others that come up. But this one is um, sort of related to things that we think about at school or related to the Rise Experience question or our global travel question. Uh, which we've had uh, with respect to the ways that we typically educated MBAs. And this question is, I can see uh, how a pandemic lets us be creative by incorporating new experiences in familiar settings, such as the home or family with school and work. But how do we go about collecting new world experiences uh, outside familiar surroundings? I, I guess that's uh, akin to this idea of you know, how do we avoid the loss of or compensate for the loss of novelty that we get when we go someplace we haven't been or get stimulated by people we haven't uh, met before, you know, uh, actual strangers. Yeah, so th there are, are virtual ways of, of, of doing this and lots of museums and cultural sites uh, now allow virtual tours. Uh, and you can get, uh, I mean, you're not, you know, close up in person, uh, but you're getting to see a greater variety of things that for practical reasons uh, you wouldn't have been able to do in the past year. So I think it's about taking advantage of, of what's out there right now and to realize that uh, these virtual experiences and tours are something that uh, might end after the pandemic is over. So you know, what a great chance to get out there and explore lots of different things, lots of new uh, areas, parts of the world and cultural sites, and then see which ones you know, really speak to you. And then after the pandemic, uh, you kind of narrow down your list of, of where, you, where you wanna travel to next. So uh, I think it really just goes back to you know, building off of the strength of, of what we have in front of us. And that's these new virtual experiences that haven't, haven't been there uh, before. Thank you, Scott. I have actually one more. I got a, I got a nudge over here for that. And it's a good question, which is, could you just say a word about how your professional relationship with Marie Kondo began? And if we'll have other chances to hear from you both about your book and your work? So our, our uh, relationship began uh, March, 2017. Uh, Stretch had just come out, and uh, she learned about the the book from someone who works on her her marketing team. And uh, you know, at first, uh, you know, she re she reached out to me and and wanted uh, to talk to me about some of the science uh, behind her ideas. And you know, I, I of course uh, knew who she was, and you know, I honestly struggled a little at first thinking about hmm, what's really the the connection here. I'm this you know, serious academic working in a, in a business school. And, you know, here's, here's this, this woman who, uh, you know, she's done a lot of wonderful things, but, you know, who proverbially, you know, teaches someone how to organize their closet. How do these two things actually uh, fit, fit together? But that was really a reflection of my own uh, naivety because uh, we, we spent time together and I've really learned to appreciate and understand her, her message and think about this, this as, a, as a metaphor for, for life, which is, you know, how do you, how do you clean out the things in your life that just aren't, uh, you know, sparking joy and bringing you meaning and, and purpose? And, and Stretch was really about once you've cleaned everything out, how do you still solve all the problems that you need to solve with, with less things around? And that started our, our partnership and uh, you know, we um, decided on the spot right there in, in March that we would try to write a book together about work that was not the intention of our, of our original meeting. And we started working uh, um, you know, 
uh, collaboratively, but online because we were in different different parts and of course uh, language barriers as well. And we uh, started building our, our collaboration that way. And uh, you know, three three plus years later, uh, we came out with uh, uh, with this with this book. Um, you know what what the future looks like. Uh, you know, again, I think it's I think it's un, unpredictable. Like like many things uh, right now, we had a lot of plans uh, during uh, during our launch. Uh, that we had to scrap because of the pandemic and uh, we'll kind of uh, take things uh, how they are after we have a better sense of uh, what things are going to look like after the pandemic. Well, thank you, Scott. Uh, this has been an absolutely fascinating, wonderful. I, I think we could all talk to you for hours. You have a lot of great advice for us, but this has been generous of you. And on behalf of everyone at Rice, I want to thank you uh, always coming through for us as a wonderful professor of ours. And thank you for connecting to all the participants uh, on the beginning of this uh, uh, homecoming week. And I hope it was a great experience. That's, that's all we have. Thanks everybody for joining us. And uh, uh, we hope to see you uh, at least virtually around Rice uh, throughout the week. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Bye everybody. Bye, thank you.